So hello everybody and welcome back to the Fund Retirement Podcast and absolutely delighted to be joined by Paul Bellinger, who is a perfect example of how to fund your retirement. Paul is actually a chemical engineer by profession, but he retired at the age of 50, having achieved financial independence through saving and investing, giving himself the freedom of choice. Paul now has a very successful YouTube channel called Evidence Based Wealth and recently launched his own website where he shares his theories, insights into the markets and highlights the flaws and theories that he found to be false over his 25 years investing journey. The channel now has a few hundred videos and topics ranging from wealth building, preservation, economics and politics. And he's currently writing a book which he posts each chapter for free on his website, evidencebasedwealth.com. And I really high, highly recommend reading and visiting that website. Hello, Paul. Thank you for, for joining us today. Oh, hi, Lee. I'm glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, no, really, really, really excited to have you on. Um, what to bring you on and, and share your story, your journey, because as I said, in, in you know, you, you've, you've done it, you've walked the walk, um, and there's no one better to talk the talk. So I think it'd be really good for the audience to, to hear, you know, your backstory, your journey, you know, how you started out, you know, how long you've been doing it and how you've made the transition to financial independence. Okay, sure. Uh, let, me, let me start out by uh, talking about how I got into my career. So, you know, I, I went into chemical engineering because I, I liked chemistry and I have a very strong affinity for math. And it's just something that I enjoy. Mm -hmm. So I did my undergraduate work at a uh, private college, uh, Villanova University in Pennsylvania. And then I went on to get my PhD at Lehigh University, uh, also in Pennsylvania. I started my working career uh, in the mid to uh, late 90s. And I uh, had a few different uh, jobs with different companies, but ultimately I settled with one that was in Western New York that I really enjoyed, which uh, worked in the industrial gases area, producing oxygen, nitrogen, argon for you know, industrial purposes, hydrogen, helium, carbon dioxide, uh, electronic gases, you name it, they did it. Uh, so it was a very diverse job. I, I enjoyed it a lot, um, but all throughout my career, uh, especially because I had been part of a, a couple jobs that uh, I either didn't like or uh, didn't work out for financial reasons. Mm -hmm. I knew that job security was something that you really can't count on in the modern world. Yeah. And so I, I put together a strategy for how to accumulate wealth uh, so that I could obtain what was called you know, financial independence. And by financial independence, what I mean is the freedom to do uh, what you choose, regardless of the circumstances. Nice. Uh, so if, if you want to keep working, um, by all means, keep working. Just be satisfied knowing that that parachute is there in case you need it. Yeah. If you decide that you'd like to uh, maybe transition and do something completely different with your life that you haven't been trained in or start a business, uh, having that financial parachute will give you the, the, the freedom and the confidence that you can go out and take some risks that otherwise you wouldn't take. Or you could uh, just go ahead and decide that you would like to completely devote your life to something different, for example, nonprofits or, or whatnot, yeah. and not have to rely upon an income. Yeah. Um, so my plan during that entire time was just to continue working where I had, um, because I've been successful. I've reached a fairly high level within my corporation. Um, I ended up being a director of research and development. Nice. And then in 2017 or 2018, it was 2017, uh, the company announced their uh, plans to merge with another major competitor mm. who was based in Europe. Um, so it was a, a bit of an uneasy time for a lot of people. I knew that a lot, a lot of my coworkers had expressed a lot of concern. Um, I was feeling a, a little bit more comfortable simply because of the financial position. So okay. you know, and it, it provided peace of mind. And then when the merger turned out to be actually uh, very unfriendly towards a lot of workers, and it created a, a bit of a miserable uh, working experience simply because cultures, uh, they didn't mix well. I mean, uh, the, the uh, company that was in Europe had their own engineering division, just like we had had our own engineering division. And so the, um, the, the two teams didn't really play nicely together in the same sandbox. Yeah, quite a bit of competition, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I had a, a discussion with my wife, um, and this was also uh, shortly after one of my close colleagues, unfortunately, had taken his own life because of uh, the, oh. the horrible things that have been happening at work. Right. And um, I decided for the sake of my marriage, the sake of my you know, mental health, 
the right thing to do was to step out of that um, yeah. environment and uh, pull the trigger on the next stage of, of retirement. Really? And so that's that's basically how I got to where I am now. So I, I turned 50 in May and that was about the right time to pull the trigger. And I think it sent a very strong message to my my coworkers as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it gives them a bit of a kick up the, um, the rear, should we say? Yeah. 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 Oh, that's brilliant. So, you know, over those years, obviously, to get from point A to point B, you, you must have had a, a, an, inve- an investing philosophy like an investing strategy because mm-hmm. uh, you obviously accumulated enough wealth in that period to be able to say, Do you know what? I don't need this anymore. I'm going to pursue my own goals, my own sort of make my own choices. You know, so what was, what was that investing philosophy, that strategy that took you from point A to point B? Okay. Uh, that's a, that's a very good question. And I think it's that- probably quite a, a long answer. I'm guessing. <laughs> uh- not maybe, not, maybe not as much as you, you would think, because right. I mean, the answer is something that in hindsight, everyone should really know intuitively. Yeah. Right? There's, a, in that there's really not much uh, to it, but I stress it very heavily in my book because I think a lot of people focus so much on investing returns that they forget the key message. And that is that um, in order to get returns, you, you basically have to have something to invest, mm. which means saving heavily. And so mm. early, early in my career, um, you know, I developed this philosophy that in order to get there, you really have to save heavily. Yeah. And um, this primarily came from an experience that I'd had uh, somewhat early in life. I had uh, two great aunts and a great uncle, uh, John, Ann, and Martha. And they, they were um, public service workers. They, they had fairly low incomes. And so it surprised everyone um, after they had died. I mean, they, they had lived together, by the way, in the same brownstone. They, they uh, had a small, modest house. They, um, they never got married. Right. Um, and so when the, the last one of them passed away, everyone was very surprised that they left behind an inheritance um, for certain members of my family. It was in the millions of dollars. <laughs> right. Nice. Uh, right. But the, nice the, surprise. <laughs> yeah, ab- absolutely. But the, the yeah. funny thing was, it was all in um, certificates of deposit. They did wow. not do stock investments. Wow. Um, you know, they, they didn't do anything fancy. All they did was they, they put it in the bank and they allowed it to, you know, grow in whatever. They, they just didn't spend it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I, I put pencil to paper. And one thing that I, I determined for myself, which was actually a surprising result, was that if you're the average household and you start saving 30% of your, your after-tax income, and you do it for 35 years, um, at least in this country. I mean, I, I don't know what the um, social retirement programs are in every country, but you know, here we have social security. So if you, um, if you use the social security, which really is an annuity program set up by the government, and you, you also use your savings to supplement uh, you know, your spending needs mm-hmm. while you're in retirement, um, you can build your way to a very comfortable retirement with the same standard of living by saving 30% of your income for 30 to 35 years and never have to invest the money. Yeah. You can have a zero real rate of return and the math works. How many years is that? 30, 35, did you say? It's 30 to 35. I think, the, I think the actual answer uh, that I give in my book for the typical family works out to be 34 years. Yeah, yeah. And, so, and, I mean, and I know you've worked out on the average earnings of a typical family, haven't you? Which I think in the US is about 84,000. Yeah, that's about right. Yeah. According, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics reports. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's, it's the average. Yeah. 34 years. Yeah. I mean, and then the, the key that I don't think most people realize is that the reason why saving rate is so powerful is that, you know, not only are you saving this money that can serve as uh, something that you can spend later, but everything that you don't need to spend from your paycheck is money that you're not going to need in retirement. If you get used to the lower standard of living and you, you don't need a new fancy car every couple of years, yeah. um, you won't need that in retirement either. And so it yeah. reduces the amount that you will need to have saved. So it, it yeah. gives you a double benefit. Plus in uh, most countries, we have progressive tax systems, meaning that you know if you have a, a modest standard of living, uh, you're not going to get taxed very heavily at all on yeah. the money that you need to, to bring in in order to fund that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That does, that's another very good point as well. 
I mean, in the UK, I think it's what, about 12, 12, 12 and a half thousand you can earn without paying any tax. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's a great point. Something that probably not many people think of. Yeah. So, so I know that we've just there uh, described 34 years or 35 years with, um, with just saving 30%. What happens if we were to actually invest that what would happen if we got say a three percent or a six percent return because i know you, you go for this in your book and it's a great great mm-hmm. read um but just for the audience yeah yeah i mean you, you can get it down actually fairly low mm. um but here's where uh predictability becomes very very important um because if you can generate a real rate of return after tax of four percent um which is actually much easier said than done yeah. Um, you, you can, you can get your working career down to, uh, let's say 15 years, give or take, you know, maybe, maybe 20 years, but don't forget the math takes into account the fact that you're going to be earning that 4%, even when you're spending from your portfolio. Mm. And th- this is where the danger part comes in. I mean, when, when you're, when you're earning money and you're early on in your career, you have a lot of human capital left ahead of you. Right. Yeah. By human capital, I mean your ability to earn an income. Uh, but when you transition into retirement, especially if uh, you can't work anymore, um, or after you know a few years, you decide, oh, um, I miscalculated. I need to go back to work, and you know it, it might you might find that a lot of doors have shut for you, and so you can't go back to work. Mm. Uh, you'll be forced to spend from your portfolio. So you need to be in a position where you can count on that 4% going forward because early in your retirement life, if you're spending money and the market has just taken a big dive, you're going to be spending a very big proportion of your portfolio and you may never be able to recover from that. Okay. So, you know, you have to be able to count on that 4% after tax real rate of return uh, year in and year out. Yeah. If you can't count on that, you need to be more conservative, which means either delaying retirement, reducing your spending in retirement, uh, or um, you know, reducing your assumed rate of return and going to a, a more modest um, you know, investment structure or portfolio allocation. Yeah, yeah. So, for, so you, but for also 4% when the S&P has returned, what, on average, 6 7%, I think, on average, for the last, like, 30 years, is it, or something like that? I'm trying to remember your quote in the book there. Yeah, that's, a, that's about right. Um, but here's the thing. When you, when you mention the average, um, you know, that, that's in good times and bad times. If you, if you talk yeah. to the person who retired, let's say, in 1970 or 1971, they had an absolutely miserable rate of return over the yeah. subsequent 10 years. The same thing happens with the person who uh, had chosen – the year 2000 to retire in, right? The next 10 years was absolutely brutal. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, well, that's, it's a great, it's a great, um, what I was leading to was obviously within those um, years, because let's, let's, let's take the, let's take a 20, 25 year window. You've had down, you've had down years in mm-hmm. the S&P, say for an example. Um, how did you manage to stick with your plan and your strategy over those periods? Because, you know, the average person, as we know through the data, just doesn't, you know, they, they, they tend to cash out at the wrong time and by hitting at the wrong time as well. So how did you manage to maintain your discipline through those periods? Well, I have to admit that early on, um, there was no discipline, right? right. Um, early on, I, I, was, I was young mm. uh, and, and brash. And, uh, you know, you, you can't... Um, well, I, I'll, I'll say for myself, I, I was young and I was probably not very teachable because it, it's easy to, to uh, come to the conclusion that you, you figured it all out and you know everything. Oh, when, when, when you're young and in your 20s, yeah. you're like, well, I don't need any sort of help. I'm, yeah. I'm, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the, the philosophy of stability that uh, I developed, you know, I've, I've developed over the past, you know, seven or eight years. Okay. Uh, Whereas my investing career has actually been more like, uh, what, 20, 25, 20 to 25 at this point. Right. And so early on, um, 
I was studying all kinds of ways to outsmart the markets, right? I, I studied value investors. I devoured books by uh, Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett. I followed them very carefully. I mean, I started uh, looking at stocks and then I noticed in, I guess it was 1997 or 1998, there was news that Warren Buffett had bought a bunch of silver. Hmm. And th this, yeah. you know, I was like, what, what the heck is going on? I, the potential I, cornering of the silver market. <laughs> yeah, I mean, wait, what, what does he know? Why is he doing this? It seems like a grand departure from everything that he's said is important. And so um, I started studying it. Yeah. And I came across some very, I, I would say, influential or, or well-written arguments by um, individuals such as uh, Ted Butler. I mean, he's still around today and he's still talking about how the futures market is manipulated. But at, at the time, uh, I had this belief that silver was going to do absolutely fantastic. So I started uh, accumulating it. And at the same time, I started studying sound money. And that's when I um, you know, learned all about gold and then started adding a lot of that to my portfolio mix. But during the 2000s, I was very heavy in gold and silver. I had some stock, and it was mostly uh, gold and silver. Yeah. which, you know, I mean, I guess my, uh, my timing was right, but I think the reasoning that I had was not sound. Yeah. Um, Element of luck, do you think? Yeah, yeah, a bit. Um, now, so heading into the year 2011, uh, I got an opportunity to sell almost all of my silver. I took advantage of it. I did so in um, three steps. I think it was uh, February through April of that year. Mm -hmm. And it just so happens that a large portion that I sold, uh, I did manage to top tick within a couple of dollars of the high. Yeah. But I will admit freely that that was luck. A <laughs> couple of hours of the high. <laughs> yeah, it had no, nothing to do with skill. Yeah. Right? yeah. Um, so, you know, but the, the reason why I sold it was I noticed that the price was going parabolic and there were a whole bunch of YouTube channels coming out with novices who were teaching everybody um, how they could get rich in silver, how it was going oh, to $500 yeah. an ounce. And it just seemed like, okay, th this is getting crowded. It's getting crazy. Um, I think it's going to go down from here. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, I sold most of it and it just so happened that it was in, uh, it, it was right around the right time. Mm -hmm. um, now, if I had had a hundred percent hindsight perfection or for, I'm sorry, foresight perfection, I think I would have not put it put as much of it as I did in gold and I would have put much more of it in stock, but nobody knows what the future is. Yes. Yeah. Right. Um, and so, you know, I, I watched over the next couple of years as my uh, uh, nominal value of the gold holdings had gone down and started thinking very strongly, okay, what, what could I have done to have avoided this? Yeah. And that's when I came up with, uh, you know, my unique blend of stock and gold, mm -hmm. which has been very predictable over a 50 plus year time horizon or, or time history. And had I adopted that back in 2011, I probably would have been even you know, better off than I am now and able right. to repair even years earlier. Yeah. So, Yeah. And that is an absolute perfect sort of way that I was going to get you to open up if you didn't mind. You know, what is your, what is your blend of portfolio? Because, you know, at, at chapter eight, uh, you explain how you you use something that is not quite mainstream convention, where you use quite a high percentage of gold um, as opposed to using bonds, which is the traditional sort of mm. um, balancing of a portfolio, isn't it? And also you don't rebalance that often compared to more of a mainstream convention. Mm -hmm. So what sort of percentages are you using and, and how have you come to that conclusion? Um, you know. Okay. Uh, well, let me step back before I give the percentages and just talk about um, what I think fundamentally changed in 1971 and why so many mainstream economists, I think, uh, have gotten it wrong. Um, so the, the, the mainstream economists, as you said, promote bonds as a way to stabilize a portfolio. Yeah. And they use um, prior history and statistical analysis of that history in order to justify how they got to their mix and why they use bonds and stocks. But what they don't realize is that um, be, when Nixon closed the gold window in August of 1971, the fundamental definition of money uh, changed. 
Now, it might not have changed for gold and silver bugs, but it did change for government and it changed for the population. <clears throat> and so it, it basically de-linked de gold from money and from bonds. So, you know, the definition of bonds completely changed. Okay. Um, and that's, you know, why the price of gold has uh, fluctuated as, as much as it has over the years. Because prior to 1971, it was the amount of gold that was in the treasuries that uh, stabilized trade and stabilized the currencies. But after 1971, the amount was fixed and the nominal price is what acted to do the balancing of, of trade and uh, provide backing to the currency. And so when I take a look at data, uh, the only data I think is relevant is 1971 and beyond. And when I do that analysis, what I notice is that, um, you know, gold is incredibly volatile just by itself. Yeah. However, it's what I call anti-correlated against financial assets. And that's both, um, you know, U.S. domestic stocks, foreign stocks, as well as currency and bonds. So it, it basically tends to move the opposite direction. If you take a look at only one year periods of time, you'll notice that it's weakly negatively correlated. And you'll also notice that bonds are weakly positively correlated against stocks. Again, one of those reasons why the financial experts say, you know, okay, let's, let's go with bonds. Because if you take a look at it one year at a time, um, yes, bonds are not very correlated with stocks. Yeah. So it works as long as you rebalance it once per year. But if you take a look at longer stretches of time, and these are stretches of time that investors should care about, five years, 10 years, and you do a correlation over 10 years, what you'll notice is that um, the correlation between bonds and stocks grows. It grows to the point where it's between about 0.5 to 0.6. This is the Pearson R correlation coefficient, meaning that they largely move in the same direction. Whereas gold becomes more strongly negatively correlated against uh, stocks and bonds. Okay. And so that means that for a person with a longer time horizon, gold, even though it's more volatile, will do a better job acting as a ballast for an equity portfolio than, than bonds will. And so you can, well, by constructing a portfolio that's a mix of gold and stock and comparing it against a mix of bonds and stock over the past five decades, you'll notice that there were a couple whole decades where a rebalanced portfolio of stocks and bonds did very, very poorly. Again, this was in the 1970s and the point of time between the year 2000 and 2010. Right. Whereas the mix of bond, uh, stocks and gold um, had almost the same performance in right. each decade, yeah. uh, which is something that we want to see. Yeah, and that's... Can you just explain to the audience when you talk about the, uh, the, the, the correlations, positive and negative, can you just explain a little bit about the significance of that and why that's important? Um, okay, sure. Um, you know, assets will um, fluctuate in price over time. Um, it's very, very difficult to predict which direction the prices are going to go. You know, I think the reason for that is that it's a competitive market and people are always looking for the best investments so they, they pour tons of research into things. And so, you know, the, the price of assets is going to be more or less a reflection of the consensus opinion at any point in time, yeah. meaning that future price movement is going to be largely a result of things that nobody anticipated. So when you look at stocks, when you look at bonds, when you look at gold, um, there are ways to estimate what they're going to do in the future but part of the actual return is going to be um, largely random. And that's the, that's the speculative element. So if you invest in one of those by itself, you're, you're largely um, uh, taking a lot of risk on fortune going your way. But if you take a look at two assets side by side, what you'll find is that if one of them moves in a um, positive direction more than you would expect it to, there's a good chance that another asset is going to be moving less in that direction than you would have expected it to. And that's the, the situation we find ourselves in with uh, golden stocks. It's a, it's a little bit like um, having an investment in a uh, bathing suit company 
and a coat manufacturer, right? Both are going Great to do, analogy. <laughs> yeah, both are going to do very well over long periods of time, but there are going to be certain seasons when one company is going to do better than the other. Yeah. So when bathing suits are doing well, maybe winter coats are not doing so well and vice versa. So if you combine those two into a portfolio, you'll find that your average rate of growth will be about the same as it would be in either one of those companies alone. However, the smoothness of the ride is going to be a lot more even. And so that, that's what uh, you know, the, the mix of gold and stocks is all about. If yeah. uh, stocks are doing very well, gold is going to be doing less well. It doesn't mean it's going to be losing. It's just going to be doing less well than it ordinarily would and vice versa. Yeah. And I find that the magic mix that uh, minimizes the volatility and maximizes predictability is actually 65% stock and 35% gold. Yeah. And I've done, done some work and found that it's about the same for uh, whether you're, you're talking about uh, international stocks or U.S. stocks. The, the mix of stocks and gold seems to be about uh, 65-35. Yeah, it's that. Yeah, so basically, the, the the gold then is is almost a hedge against stocks. If stocks are rising, golds tend to traditionally not rise. But then, if we're into a, a bear market or a correction, then gold traditionally in that period will rise, which balances out the portfolio. So over time, the portfolio rises, right. um, as you say, quite smoothly. And you have to you have to look at it too on the um, inflation adjusted basis. So you're probably not going to see it if you uh, only look at nominal numbers hmm. because the, the nominal numbers uh, reflect what's happening with the currency. And of course, when the, the currency is debased, all assets go up. <laughs> Do you think that's what we're seeing right now? <laughs> um, to a certain extent, maybe. Yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, it's, it's, uh, so what sort of percentages have you kind of utilized over, over then the years to, to achieve where you are now then? Okay, well, um, I divide my investment assets into um, buckets. Okay, so uh, you alluded before to the phases of my retirement. So I have one bucket of assets that are largely equity that I never intend on selling. So I don't care really what the price of those assets are. So I don't feel the need to hedge those with gold. Then I have another set of assets which I do intend on selling. And these are things that are in my um, IRA accounts, my 401k. Um, so there's going to be a certain amount of forced selling later because of required minimum distribution laws here in the US. Okay. And so I do care about the price of those 10 years from now when I plan on starting to sell. Hmm. And those, I, I mix those with uh, gold on the side just as price insurance. And that's a 65-35 mix of yeah. stock versus gold, okay. maximize the predictability. Yeah. So if you take a look at my portfolio in its entirety, which would include that income producing part that I would never sell, um, the actual fraction of gold turns out to be more like 20% than 35. Right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I'm, I'm presuming by what you said there, they're dividend producing stocks with their producing income in your bucket one, are they dividend producing stocks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, what sort of, like, may we ask what sort of sectors? Um... Well, I don't focus on specific sectors. I, I focus on um, value funds. Right. So I like um, certain investments. I don't know if I'm a, a now allowed to, to mention the name of them here, but um, there are certain high dividend yield funds, um, certain value funds that I like to be in because they will automatically give you higher dividends and a yeah. lot of diversification. And so I don't have to worry about, let's say, um, you know, investing 100% in the banking sector and having to worry about what ha what's going to happen to the banking sector over the next 10 years, yeah, yeah, okay. right? Or what's going to happen with fossil fuels or, or this or that. And so, yeah. uh, you know, it's largely value index funds. Yeah. And bucket, bucket two, would it be fair to say, is more of like a growth type sort of trajectory fund as well then? So you've got bucket one, bucket two, and bucket two is more of a, a, tra a growth trajectory. I go with all value, yeah, okay. all value. Um, and, and the reason for that is that, um, you know, we, we talk about the market, but there is no market. It's, it's like talking about real estate, right? I mean, if, are, are you buying houses in Philadelphia? Are you buying houses in London? Are you buying houses in mm. uh, Mongolia? It's, it's a different market, right? So if you take a look at different sectors, 
um, you know, each behaves as its, as its own thing, right? Mm-hmm. So if we take a look at the S&P 500, I forget what the actual price to earnings ratio is. It's something like uh, 35. It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's pretty high because we have, I think, five or six dominant stocks. We have Microsoft, Apple, Google, Facebook, uh, yeah. Tesla. Um, what's, what's the other one that's in there? Yeah, well, you get the idea. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I think the audience do as well, yeah. Yeah, but that, I mean, that, those are very, uh, very popular names. And uh, I think they've skewed what we call the market towards very, very high valuations. Mm. But if you just buy um, value indices, it screens those out. And so you don't have to worry about um, having 1% of your, your overall portfolio in, in Tesla, for example. Mm. Take a look at Tesla. It's, uh, its revenues are less than, um, you know, one or two of the major car companies. But if you take a look at its market capitalization, the market capitalization is greater than uh, GM, Ford, Volvo, Volkswagen, and Toyota all combined. Yeah, it is. it's it's pretty mental, isn't it, that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I, I like to avoid things like that. And um, that's the reason why I'm 100% in value. Yeah, yeah, I understand, yeah. And I, I think also as well, and... and... What's your perception at the moment, right? Because obviously there's a lot of fear out there at the moment, isn't there? There's there's concern about the future, you know, where we're heading, what, what the markets will do next. Um, but how do you mitigate that fear? How do you mitigate that risk, the, the unknown of the future? Um, is it the percentage ratio of gold, knowing that um, if it does all end up bad, then you know, gold will shine, as the saying goes? <laughs> <laughs> that's That's certainly part of it. Yeah. That's certainly part of it. The, um, the other thing that gives me a lot of comfort is, you know, knowing that, uh, you know, our lifestyle isn't so high that, yeah, okay. you know, we, we'd be missing out on a lot. But also the, the dividends tend to be stabilizing um, forces in and of themselves. Um, if, if you look at the survivability rate of portfolios over time for people that are taking withdrawals, the value segments tend to be a little bit more robust to sequence of withdrawal problem than growth components. And the the reason for that is that, um, especially in the US, uh, the companies that are high dividend payers uh, do so because they they believe that their shareholders value having a large and predictable source of income. And so they're very careful. Uh, not to raise the dividend to a point where they think that they would have to lower it at some point in the future. Right. And so if, um, if you're spending from your portfolio and a third to a half of what you're counting on as the income is coming from those dividends, if you get into a bear market for stocks, you're going to be selling fewer shares of those companies at unfortunate times than otherwise you would. And so having, having a high level of dividend to me means uh, protection against future events. It, it yeah. reduces the uncertainty of them. Yeah, I guess what, the, what you've just made me think about there is that be careful you don't become a prisoner to the dividend paying stocks. Because if you're a prisoner to your job, you need that job for your income to, mm-hmm. to, to maintain your lifestyle. What you don't want to do is just basically swap what you're doing for your day-to-day job for yeah. dividend paying stocks. You just become yeah. trapped again, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and uh, there, there's cash too, uh, by the way. Oh, yeah, when, cash. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, cash. Don't when, forget when, money. <laughs> that's right. When, uh, when you invest in, in dividend stocks, I did take a look at the worst case condition for high dividend paying stocks. And it turned out that um, it was right during and after the financial crisis of 2008. Mm. So the companies actually did reduce their dividends by quite a bit. I think it was uh, like 40%, uh, 50%. And gradually they were able to, to recover from that. But it took, it took some time. And so um, if you want to be able to continue to spend the same amount from your portfolio and not have to worry about selling the stocks, hmm. I think having a couple years worth of dividend payments stored up as cash makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's- it's a it's a reservoir that you can draw from. Yeah, it's also the cash when there's the market presents buying opportunities. If there is a correction or whatever, then yeah, you know you're there in position to 
to take advantage of that. So yeah. Yeah. Um if somebody so obviously now if anyone's listening to this, they've they've heard your story, your philosophy, your you know, you're obviously extremely well versed in, in what you're doing and where you've been and where you've come from. And it's absolutely fascinating listening to you. If someone was starting off right now and thinking, well, how do I even begin? What would be your advice to them? Or what would be your not advice, but what would you share with them to, to, to get them started on the road to be able to achieve financial independence? Well, it's the same advice that I'm actually giving to my eldest son right now. How old is your eldest son? Uh, he's 18 right now. So right, he's, yeah. yeah, he's starting college, um, but he'll be finishing college before I know it. Time tends to go by. Yeah, very- yeah, it does. It goes very quickly when children are involved. <laughs> But, you know, I, I've always had discussions with him, first and foremost, about um, making choices, right? I mean, you, you have a limited amount of resources, and you have to decide what it is that you want to spend your money on. So we're always having discussions around needs versus wants. Mm-hmm. And if you really, really want this one thing, how do you know that you're not going to regret that decision, you know, a year from now when you decide that you want something else? So. That's the, that's the first thing, separate near, need from want and maybe give it a little bit of time before you buy something big and shiny. Yeah. Uh, you know, if you still want it, you know, a few weeks Unless later, it's gold. Unless it's gold, right. <laughs> um, the, the next thing is uh, debt. Mm-hmm. Uh, I am a big believer in staying out of debt. Um, the only exception being buying a house. And that's because it's impractical for people to buy a house without debt in today's world. Uh, the, by the time you save up enough money to pay cash, the price is going to be much, much higher than, than it otherwise would be. Um, but we live in a low interest rate world. And this is where I think a lot of people are getting confused. Um, because they start thinking, oh, now is the time to take out debt. Right? We, we can lock in these low interest rates. And what I would urge people to realize is that when you take out debt, it's really borrowing from your future. And everything that you purchase on credit, unless you can pay it back within a month or so, means that you're buying more than your resources today are saying that you can afford. Mm. And so it's, it's something that you're going to pay for long into the future. Take a car, for example. Um, let's say that you could pay cash for a car that's four years old, but you decide, I would really rather have the new car and I'm going to take out one of these zero interest rate loans and I'm going to um, you know, pay it over eight years, yeah. which car companies will now allow you to do. It might seem like a very smart thing to do at the time, but what they've essentially done is they've they've tricked you psychologically into buying more than otherwise you might. Yeah. Right. I mean, there have been um, studies. I think uh, ING did one of the first studies about credit and how it influences people's spending behaviors. And what they found was that uh, when McDonald's introduced the ability to swipe credit cards, people would actually buy more food. Than really? They used to. Yeah. Every, yeah. Every, every, every transaction was larger than it had been back when people had to actually tender cash and it had to do with the pain response in the brain. Handing it over. Exactly. Yeah. It over. Okay. So, um, okay. So need, needs versus wants is the first thing. Stay out of debt is the second thing. The third thing is live well below what your means say that you, you can. Um, Cause if you really want to build wealth, the way to do it is not to save 5% of your income, but to save you know, 20, 30, in my case, I say 50% of my income. Right. Yeah. Okay. And you, you'll be amazed at how quickly it adds up, even if you're not earning a great return. Yeah. And then the, the last thing I would say is don't take unnecessary risks, right? The old saying is once you've won the game, stop playing. Yeah. Well, if you're saving a lot of your money and you're staying out of debt and you, you have a reasonable standard of living, you don't need to take a lot of risks. You can get there and um, you don't need to you know, buy the next Bitcoin or um, you know, buy a penny stock and have it go up yeah. by a factor of 10. There's a lot of comfort in knowing that you can do it with just cash if you chose to. Yeah. And then if you want to uh, 
if you want to accelerate things, I mean, by all means, go after, um, you know, solid investment results. But before you do, make sure that it's something that you can stick with for a very, very long time. Mm. Uh, pick a mix that, you know, you, you know will perform reasonably well mm. over time. In your planning, make uh, conservative assumptions about what the rate of return is going to be. Because if you make a, an aggressive assumption about how your, your uh, investments are going to perform, you will naturally tend to save less. And then um, just you know, stay, stay the course, maintain discipline. Don't, yeah. don't feel like you have to go after the, the next shiny object, yeah. unless it's gold, of course, right? <laughs> unless it's gold. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, for me, and I would just add to that, um, I would also encourage anybody to, to visit your YouTube channel and also visit your website. Um, because there's such a wealth of information on there. And for me, not it doesn't matter what stage of the journey you're at uh, for investing um, or building wealth for retirement. I think you've got so much great information, whether you're just starting out or whether you're already in phase two or phase three, um, which I know you talk about on your, on your channel, uh, and you'll get great value for, from visiting Evidence-Based Wealth, Paul's YouTube channel and um, his website. Um, would you like to share a little bit about your website, please, as well, and, and what you're doing with it? Because you know it's fascinating. Basically, you, you you're giving it away for free, and all you're asking for is donations. Just just look, you know, give a donation. You know, if you've got value from it, so please, you know, share a little bit about that, Paul. Um, sure, sure. Um, now before I do, could I just give one little caveat? You mentioned the uh, the YouTube channel. Okay, yeah, please do. Yeah, I, sorry. More people, one thing. Um, you will find a lot of different videos on there and they're told from two different perspectives about how to view the world of finance. There are some videos in there that talk about gold and silver as insurance yeah. that talk about what happens if financial assets completely fail. Mm. Now, a lot of people gravitate towards those and they tend to believe that um, this is the reason why gold is going to $5,000, why it's going to $10,000. while it's going that we just those videos are really um, trying to tell the story about uh, gold as insurance and what could happen. Um, they were never really meant to say, don't take advantage of the status quo type investments that can perform quite well during normal times. Because mm -hmm. uh, we never know when normal is going to stop or how long normal is going to, to continue going. Um, so, I mean, they, the wealthy families of the world have known this for a long time. And the way that they protect their dynasties is with art, collectibles, gold, lands, and yeah. things. Well, they build legacy, don't they? It's a different mindset. Yeah. It's a different yeah. mindset. So anyway, the, what I wanted to do was I wanted to warn people that go to my YouTube channel just to keep that in the back of their, their minds whenever they're viewing um, you know, various videos because each one is told from a different perspective. And probably the best place to start is with some of the, uh, uh, the watch lists that I put together, which basically string things together in a logical order yeah. uh, so that people who are just getting started won't get lost in the wrong message. Yeah. So essentially you visit YouTube channel, evidence-based wealth, and start with playlists, which you've categorized in, in easy to digest formats that kind of succinctly make sense. Right. Yeah. Perfect. And your website? Oh, yeah. The, the website is evidencebasedwealth.com. Uh, the reason why I got it started was because um, although a lot of people tend to prefer video type formats, what I found over time is that it's very difficult to um, convey complex ideas in video format. Um, some things are much easier uh, written down, and a lot of people will find that the lessons are more effectively learned if they read in, in a written format. And so I've, I've started taking a lot of what I consider to be the core concepts and I started writing articles and I've been putting up uh, book chapters as I write them. Uh, yeah. Currently I'm up to chapter eight. Um, there's going to be 14 chapters and I'm uh, planning on being done by the end of the year. And um, early next year, I'll format it for actual physical print and um, you know, I'll tell people where they can go to, to buy it in physical print. But for now it's available in digital format. Um, for free. And the reason why it's for free is because I wanted to attract the widest audience that I could. You know, I, I feel like uh, I've been blessed to have come across a lot of really good information over my investing career. And a lot of people did offer uh, the information for free. Yeah. And that was the spirit of the YouTube channel. 
Um, so the website is also free, so people can go there. Um, but it does take a lot of effort. So if you want to express your appreciation, <laughs> yeah, hit, hit the donate button and throw you know ten dollars my way. I I would uh, you know greatly appreciate it. It helps me uh, spend less of you know my portfolio. You know, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, uh, but yeah, the the information is there. My hope is that as in the YouTube channel, we get very good discussion and dialogue going because I think that one of the blessings that I've had, um, you know, as a uh, video producer is that I've attracted a lot of very thoughtful people who have interacted in the comment sections and um, people have found that there's a lot of value in the comments, uh, talking back and forth with each other, sharing their own ideas, bringing up potential weaknesses in, uh, you know, what I I'm proposing in my videos. So it gives me things to think about too. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. So it's almost challenging your own thoughts and making you think differently as well. Right. Right. So it it should be a, it should be a community. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah. So that's excellent. Um, yeah. So there you go. I mean, you know, Paul Bellinger, fascinating journey, great story, and hopefully you've got good value and, uh, you know, ways to take it next as well. Well, thank you very much, Paul, for joining us today. And I hope that the listeners and audience have really enjoyed that. What we'd like to do is, um, you know, bring you back for a part two, because I know this was like an overview of, of Paul Bellinger and your journey, your story, but I know you've got a much more, uh, you know, uh, deeper thought process in your investing philosophy. And it'd be great to do a part two with you sometime in the future, if you're open for that. Sure, I'd love to. It was a lot of fun today, Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. Take care. I hope you enjoyed the video and if you haven't subscribed yet go ahead and subscribe to our youtube channel and you don't have to stop there either we have more videos on the screen for you and lots more insightful content on our channel and at our website fundyourretirement.com i want to thank you very much for your time and i'll see you in the next video bye for now